Hi, everybody. Um, how's everybody doing on Friday? I, this is pretty awesome. Let me figure out how to share my screen while I awkwardly do small talk. Uh, how do I do this? How do I, okay, share screen there. Okay, all right. Okay, good. I don't have to come up with awkward small talk. Okay, so the title of my talk is The Sky is Not the Limit. According to Cleverism, ask Oh, no, my Google follow is being Find weird. Some deep and really okay, this is... Starters. Ask oh, questions, technical difficulties. Sorry, guys. Well. Research some really cool, but you Trust me, I've worked for NASA. Well. There we go. All right. Um, so in true engineering fashion, I'm going to give you an overview of what my talk is about. Uh, we're going to start briefly with my story. Then we're going to talk about some myths that I've ran into and I know that other people ran into as they're pursuing careers in the space industry. Um, I'm also going to talk about the NASA pipeline, things you don't know, things you might know, things you don't know, and some tips and tricks that I have for launching your career in aerospace. And hopefully, if there's time, we can we can uh, do a little bit of question and answers. If not, you can definitely catch me on the Slack channel after my talk. Okay, so getting started. Uh, introductions. My name is Aaron. Uh, like it was mentioned earlier, I graduated with my BS in biochem from Claflin University. And then I decided after a little while that I really wanted to do engineering. So I decided to go back for a BS and MS in electrical engineering. The question marks by the graduation year are very intentional. I don't know when I'm going to graduate and hopefully it'll be soon. Um, some of the reasons why I in general, when I give talks, I like to kind of explain like, hey, this is why you should listen to me. Um, I do have a small bit of knowledge when it comes to the space sector. I am a two-time South Carolina Space Grant Fellow, a two-time intern with NASA Langley. I've got well over a thousand hours of federal research experience and I've got one publication in process. We just submitted it, fingers crossed that it goes through because that's a resume booster. Okay, so first section, my story, and hopefully we will do this in 10 minutes or less. I, I like to begin everything with a quote, and I found this one and I thought it was awesome. I, Earth is the cradle of humanity, but mankind cannot stay in the cradle forever. That is from Konstantin Tchaikovsky, who was a famous Russian rocket scientist. And it's kind of ironic because I'm talking about NASA, which came up to show the Russians that, hey, we can do space too. But that's neither here nor there. Okay, so when I was little, I dreamt about working here. And when I say here, I'm talking about the picture to your left. As a matter of fact, this is from when I was in art class around second or third grade. And the teacher said, make a picture of where you want to work. And this is what I did. Um, I show this picture to, to, really, to really bring up the fact that space has just been something that I have been into for as long as I can remember. And as you can see by my amazing artistic skills, I got everything accurate down to the fact that everything is sideways, the earth is eclipsing the moon, and we've got awesome rocket ships that say USA on the bottom in my handwriting that's still, in my child handwriting that resembles my adult handwriting, but that's neither here nor there. Um, but as I got older, the world told me that my dream wasn't really practical. If you look at all these articles, they talk about the space race being a waste of money or people questioning, well, why do we do this? It's expensive, people die, it's dangerous. And one big point in my story is when NASA or the actually President Bush in 2004 announced that the space shuttle program would be canceled. I can actually, I can vividly remember where I was when I heard that because I just stared at the floor and I was like, wow, well, what am I going to do? I, it doesn't make sense for me to pursue a career in this field if it's not going to exist by the time I graduate school. Um, so I, I definitely went through a bit of an identity crisis. I, I, the dream that I had as a kid didn't seem to line up with what the world was telling me. And unfortunately, I decided to follow a more conventional path. Um, to give a brief background, I have a lot of doctors, nurses, and dentists in my family. And while no one pushed me to it, I said, okay, well, I can't do space. I guess I can just go be a doctor. And just, like, that's something I guess I can just do, yeah. Um, and so I went through that process, graduated, applied to medical school, took the MCAT, all that fun stuff, and got in. And I started my first year. And as I was doing my first year, I noticed something. Um, 
everybody around me was happy or everybody was happy for me and people were really excited about where they were. But, and, and I tried to look happy and I tried to match that environment on the outside, but on the inside, I was really sad. And I couldn't explain it for a long time. I just, I, I never really felt 100% like myself. Um, it took a while and I was thinking about it. Um, and like it was mentioned in the introduction, I sat down and I was watching, I was watching the European Space Agency land on a comet. And that's when I realized that, whoa, I, I gave up on my dreams just a little bit too early. And, and at the time when I was kind of making the decisions about what I want to do in life, I thought the space industry was dying. And in reality, it's not dying. Um, even now with the private sector doing, making the amazing accomplishments that they're making with the initiative to go back to the moon, the space sector is, the space sector is for lack of better words on the come up and pretty soon there's gonna be a boom. And there are a lot of really smart people in economics and business who say that this is going to be a multi, multi billion, perhaps multi trillion dollar industry. And so with that, I realized like, hey, you know, maybe there's a chance and maybe I can make this childhood dream of mine come true. After lots of soul searching, um, I decided to quit the medical field entirely. I dropped out after my first year. I had no idea what I was gonna do or how I was gonna do it, but I, I, had, a, I had a plan. I, or I, I didn't know the exact details of my plan, but I knew that I wanted to go back for engineering and I knew that I wanted to take a shot at working in the space sector. And so with that, I had to start again at square one <laughs> as referenced by the image on the slide. Things haven't been easy um, since I, I went back to school. I, I re-enrolled, I had, since my degree was in biochemistry, I had to basically start an entire degree from virtually square one. And I'm still in the process of getting through that now. Um, on top of that, I'm an adult and I have responsibilities. And so I had to work full time and go to school full time. And on top of that, for whatever reason, I thought it would be a good idea to major in electrical engineering, which is a, it's a notoriously challenging field. And so I've made my fair share of bad grades and due to the working and going to school and not being able to, to do both full time financially, things have not been easy. Um, but, you know, when I think about things, I realized that my journey is far from over and that I've had some amazing opportunities along the way. Um, I've gotten to, I've got to work at NASA multiple times. I've got to appear on the YouTube videos with what, 400, 500,000 views. I've got to go to different centers. I've got to even meet astronauts. That's Buzz Aldrin, by the way, the, in the bottom right corner, the second person to walk on the moon. I wasn't excited at all. I was just like, oh my God. Um, and so with that, I realized that, hey, it's been a challenge, but at the end of the day, I would not change it for the world because the experiences that I've had are something that I remember dreaming about when I was little. I remember dreaming about getting to wake up and go to work at NASA and like getting to see all the cool space things. And through lots of persistence, a teeny bit of stubbornness and just what I like to call sheer luck. I've been able to make those dreams come true so far, which is something that I think is absolutely incredible. Okay, moving on to the next section. Let's bust some myths that, like I said, I either I thought these were true or I know people who thought these were true. And I, they are really big barriers to entry into the space sector. A lot of people say, oh, I wanna work at NASA or I wanna work at SpaceX, and, but I don't, I don't do blank or I don't do blank. I don't have a chance. And the reality is, yes, you do. So myth number one, you need perfect grades to get opportunities at NASA. And this myth, just to give you guys a little bit of structure or a little bit of knowledge of the structure. So on the left-hand side, you're gonna see the myth and a brief justification of why that myth exists. And on the right-hand side, you're gonna see the truth based off of my experiences or the experiences of people that I know uh, who also are very active in the space community. So myth number one, you need perfect grades to get opportunities at NASA. 
Um, that myth comes from the fact that space is really challenging. We all know it. It's very hard to send things far away, going fast, at with little or no way, little or no ways to test it once it's done. Um, and so that creates the perception that you need to be perfect if you ever want to have a chance at working at space. And that us other students who are not 4.0 road scholars are just not worthy of NASA. But let's take a look at what actually makes someone worthy. Um, the truth is I've talked to a lot of NASA mentors. I've actually been I've actually been privy to NASA mentors selecting students for the next semester. And so these are the qualities that I've noticed that really make people stand out. Um, the first quality is you have to know how to work in a team. Teamwork is essential. Um, as with everything, as with everything ever, but especially in space, when you're collaborating across states and across countries and technically collaborating across the solar system, you have to, you have to be able to work in a team. The next quality that is really prevalent and people can tell right away if you, when they read your application is how willing are you to learn the task given at hand? Um, you, you have to, you're going to see a lot of new things. You're going to be in a room where everybody is smart, not just you. And so you have to be willing to learn, th think outside the box, learn new things and, um, just be open to what inf whatever information is presented to you. Another really big skill, and again, it's super obvious from applications, I've actually been able to read them and go through them, is how well can you communicate? Um, you essentially, if things go well and you're working on, imagine that you're working on a big project like the Artemis project, which is going to the moon. If you can't communicate, there are literally billions of dollars riding on that. And when I say you, I mean that in a figurative, figurative sense because the interns don't really get to touch anything that's, that's too critical. But if you're gonna continue down this career path, it is essential that you communicate because bad communication can cost the taxpayer billions of dollars and it can even cost people their lives. I, we can reference the challenger and um, the Columbia and the Challenger and the Columbia disasters just as proof. Um, and then finally, another thing that really makes your application stand out is what related experiences do you have? You might not have worked on you might not have worked on a rocket engine, but if you spend your time working on your car engine, you at least understand the process of diagnosing problems, getting your hands dirty, and you're not afraid to do the work. And that really stands out in an application. Um, on the bottom, I have a very special note, and I think it's something that's significant if you're considering trying to pursue a career at NASA, SpaceX, Boeing, there are plenty of us students who have around a 3.0 GPA. Now granted, grades, Grades aren't everything, as I'm sure that's been stated multiple times throughout this conference. They are something you kind of have, you have to know a little bit of what you're doing. Or you have to have a general, I guess, what's the word I'm looking for? An intelligence and a willingness to work. But if you're not a perfect student, people understand, and there are still plenty of opportunities for you in the space industry. Myth number two, only STEM majors get NASA internships. This myth comes from the fact that aerospace is a highly technical field. And so it would make sense that only technical people get to work in this technical field. The truth is that, at least from a NASA perspective, I know that they are, if you go through and look at their internship opportunities, you will see, you'll see postings for, postings that want students that have graphic arts Back, graphic art back design background or film background or communication because NASA really loves PR. And then another one too that a lot of people don't think about, um, I see tons of internships and even job offers for people who with business and accounting backgrounds because guess what? Space travel costs a lot of money and somebody has to manage that. So even if you're not a STEM major and you're more on the science communication side or the artistic side, there, is still, there are still plenty of chances for you in space. And 
I think you shouldn't rule yourself out just because, oh, I don't do math, physics, or engineering. Myth number three, everybody at NASA looks slash acts like, and on the left-hand side, we're gonna say Sheldon, or this, if you're on the right-hand side, you sold a group of engineers, you notice that they all look the same, they're white, they're male, they all have their pocket protectors, black tie. If you see, it's a common myth that NASA is not a diverse place. And the truth is that like most professional agencies, NASA strives to create a diverse and accepting work environment. There Now granted, yes, their diversity can always be improved just like with any other industry, any, un, any other agency. But one thing I really appreciate uh, during my time at NASA is the fact that you can really feel their commitment to, uh, their commitment and their value for diversity. The fact that they look for students from different backgrounds, the fact that they look for employees from different backgrounds. Um, I, I work with some of the smartest people in the world and we all come from different places. We believe different things, we're, we're different genders, everything. And so I think that just because you see science and space portrayed one way on TV doesn't mean that it's not, as, it's not a diverse place. And you'd be surprised. There are a lot of people who, who are either there and look like you or they want more people that look like you. So I, I think don't, I, I think, I think we often rule ourselves out of these opportunities prematurely because of, oh, well, I don't want to be the only person in the room who, in, in my case, I don't want to be the only black person in the room. And yeah, sometimes that happens. But one thing I can really appreciate about my time at the agency is I can tell that they're committed to changing that and making everybody feel included. All right. Myth number four, NASA only does space. The myth comes from the idea that when a lot of people see NASA in the media, they only see the space things. You see the rocket launches, the moon landings, the Curiosity rover on Mars singing happy birthday to itself, which is pretty lonely when you think about it. It's the only thing around, but <laughs> I'm going off on a tangent. Um, the truth is that besides space, NASA, NASA covers a broad array of fields. Um, they do research in aviation, climate change. They team up with NOAA um, to do ocean exploration. And they are really, really big on science education and outreach. And so just because if your interests aren't directly in space, that's OK. There are other opportunities. If you, if you want to work on alternative power sources like wind or solar, NASA does research on that. If you want to work on the next X plane, guess what NASA does? work on the X-Plane. So there are tons of opportunities. Don't think that only in this aerospace isn't just about space. It's also about aeronautics. It's about the planet. It's about education and outreach. So there are lots of opportunities for everybody. All right, section three, NASA career paths. So these are just general overviews of the ways that you can, you can start a career at NASA. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily work like that with other parts of the space industry, like your Boeings or your SpaceX's, but I'm gonna to speak to NASA because again, that's where I have the most experience. Um, so NASA internships, um, unlike a lot of places where you work, internships are not a direct path to civil service. Uh, civil service in this case means being a full-time employee of the government working for NASA, um, but Internships are still a great first step. Usually with NASA internships, they will occur over three sessions. They have a summer, a fall, and a spring session. They all have different deadlines, um, and they all have different dates with which they're active. And you can even start at different times within that session. For example, in the summer session, you can choose to start in May and end, start in May and finish at the end of July, or you could start in June and finish at the end of August. So there's variation within those sessions. Um, you do get a stipend. If, if I recall correctly, it's about $7,300 for undergraduate students, but housing is not provided. So that, um, that can be a bit of a hassle, but luckily there are a lot of resources out there that will point NASA interns to housing. There are Facebook groups. Um, there's a really good blog post that explains every house, 
most of the housing offers at the at the different NASA centers. So it's again a bit of a challenge, but still the stipend goes that goes pretty far. Uh, one thing I do want to note is that stipend is taxable. So yeah, that it, it comes back to bite you. Um, if you're interested in applying for internships at NASA, I um, recommend that you go to apply at intern.nasa.gov. Um, the link is on the slide, but it's pretty easy if you can't click it. So if you're interested, definitely apply. Um, now, the NASA Pathways Program, if you're really dead set on working at NASA as a government employee, then you have to go through Pathways as an undergraduate student or a graduate student. Um, in this case, it offers a direct path to civil service. Um, what basically it's the equivalent of a co-op where you alternate between school and working on center every other semester. So you spend one semester at school, one semester on center, you get the idea. Um, when you're a pathways intern, you are considered a full federal employee. And after you finish your pathways internship, you there's about a 95% chance that you'll get an offer of conversion, which is just NASA lingo for, hey, you're, instead of being a student employee, now you're a full NASA employee and you go up on the pay scale and all that. 95% um, because, I say 95%, that's the, just the statistic that's been quoted to me. Um, there have been cases where Pathways interns don't get offered conversion for whatever reason. And they're also, of course, you don't have to accept it. You can do a pathways and then say, hey, I want to go work somewhere else. And that's okay. Um, in order to get a pathways, you must be able to complete, I think it's around 640 work hours before you graduate. Um, and then this is just, just a note as someone who's been applying for the program, I have been interviewing all that. It's, it's more difficult to get than a NASA internship. Um, it, I know students that have done multiple internships at NASA and then never get, never get a pathways. And then I know students who get pathways right off the bat. So it's, it's a little challenging to track. Um, in general though, the, the trend that I've seen on center is that students will do a NASA internship or two, and then they'll apply for pathways. And that experience will give them the connections to land the pathways position. So if you're interested in that, I recommend that you apply at usajobs.gov. Okay, the last section of my talk, tips and tricks for launching your aerospace career. Again, some of these are general, but some of these can be applied broadly, but in this case, I'm gonna to speak to what I know, what I know works for NASA. Um, tip number one, Look for programs that will get your foot in the door. Aerospace and NASA are relatively small communities. And what that means is that once you're in and you get that first opportunity, getting the second one is a thousand times easier. I, from personal experience, after I got my first one, I just called and said, hey, I want to come work on center. And, so I, and my mentor said, yeah, sure. So getting your foot in the door is very important. And you should look for programs that are designed to introduce you to this industry. Um, for me personally, I went through the South Carolina Space Grant Consortium. Um, what the space grant is, and every state has one, um, it, it's money that NASA gives to each state to encourage students to do research that's related to aeronautics and space. It's to help students get internships. It's basically a big program to get more students in the door at NASA. A lot of people don't know about it because it's not well advertised, which I don't understand. But because I got my space grant, I got a fellowship from the space grant that introduced me to different programs within NASA that eventually landed me my first and second internship. Um, my first internship was actually a specific program called the NASA Academy, which is designed again to give students a big introduction to what life is like working in aerospace. And so we, in my case, there were 13 of us on a team. Um, we were given a really big project. We had to go on center, do the research. Um, we got to work with all kinds of NASA scientists to complete the project. And it, we got to attend seminars um, relating from everything to tech talks about landing on the moon to how we can 
create careers at NASA. On the side note, I you get to meet really cool people. I got to meet the I got to meet the guy who invented the super soaker. So that was pretty cool. And I wouldn't have had that experience if I didn't go through the academy. And then since the academy counts as a NASA internship, again, my foot was in the door. And so getting a second one was easy. And now, and again, for a third one, if I want to go back for the summer, I just have to write a few emails and I'm back on center. So it's definitely a good idea to look for these programs that will get, will introduce you to people, give you connections, give you resources, and that will try to lead you to a position on center. Tip number two, apply to other NASA centers besides the big three. Now, when I say the big three, I'm referencing Johnson Space Center, Kennedy Space Center, and JPL. Johnson's in Texas, Kennedy's in Florida, and JPL's in California. The reason why I refer to them as the big three is because those are the centers that you always see on TV and in movies. And likewise, if you see it, everybody else sees it. So it's really, you. if you're looking for that first opportunity with NASA, I encourage you to look elsewhere besides Florida, California, and Texas. There are centers in Ohio, Virginia, Maryland, um, multiple smaller centers in California that are not as popular. There's one in Mississippi, one in uh, West Virginia. Um, in my case, I decided to put a cross out sign over the Kennedy Space Center picture and show you the independent verification and validation facility in West Virginia. It's a great place, it's NASA, really cool work, but it's not as popular because you don't see it on TV. But I know a lot of people who are really successful because they look for the smaller, less well-known centers first. And then after a couple of rotations or a couple internships, they can move on into the bigger centers that you see on TV. So again, uh, definitely apply broadly. Don't just apply to the places that look, look, re look really cool or the places that you see on TV. Um, also, as a bonus tip to this, I would also suggest that you apply outside of the summer because the summertime is the most popular time on center. Literally, there are hundreds of students that come on, but during the spring and the fall semester, only 50 or students come on center. Mentors are looking for interns and, and it's much easier to get your application through. So definitely apply to apply to smaller centers and apply quote unquote off season. So during the spring and the fall semesters, if you can. Tip number three, do hands on stuff. And I mentioned this briefly earlier, but I'm gonna reiterate it again. I can't tell you how important it is to, if you have a side hobby and you like building robots like I do, I can't tell you how important it is to keep that up and to talk about it on, during your applications and your interviews, because what that shows people, what that shows people is that you are A, a self-starter, B, you're curious, and C, you are not afraid to get your hands dirty and you probably have learned a couple practical lessons along the way. Um, I've actually had instances where I, Something that, I, something that I figured out while building things at home in my junk room has actually helped me on my space grade research. So I definitely recommend that you do hands-on stuff and you talk about it during your application and your interviews. Tip number four, connect with your professors. The man on the right is actually a professor at my university. I saw that he did some really cool NASA space, uh, NASA space robot research. And I said, hey, I wanna join your lab. He said, yeah, sure. I did research with him for a few semesters. And then lo and behold, one day he said, hey, do you wanna come down to Johnson Space Center with us and help us with a project? And so that's, that's an amazing opportunity that I got just by connecting with the professor. So what I really recommend is that you find, if you're really interested in space related research, find professors who are doing those things and then just email them and say, hey, can I meet you? And just ask them about their research and then ask if you can join or contribute. You'd be amazed at how far that, that, that can take you. And tip number five, don't give up. I don't do what I did and give up prematurely. If you have a goal, if you have a dream, if you wanna work on something really cool and send it to space, just keep trying. You may not get exactly where you think you're going, but you'll get somewhere good. So don't give up, just keep swimming and just keep, just keep swimming. That's all I can really say. All right.
that is the end of my presentation with about two minutes to spare. Thank you for listening to me. Um, if you want to talk with, if you want to talk to me or connect with me outside of this summit, there is my social media handle. And yeah, that's all I have. Thanks for listening. Does anybody have any questions? Yay! <laughs> Thank you so much, Aaron, for uh, just pretty much uh, giving the lowdown to our attendees of how to how to succeed in their application and how to look out for resources if they want to join into NASA. Um, we do have good, we do have questions. Thank you for ending a little sooner so we're able to do some live questions. So we have one from um, uh, Kelly Charles, who says um, he has experience in Goddard and civil, civil service roles are more managerial while the hands-on are farmed, or I guess farmed out to contractors. Can you speak on that? <sighs> Yes, um, it depends in general. That's more of the case of, as a civil servant, you're gonna be in a lot of meetings. You're gonna be in a lot of, it's a lot of planning. Um, but with my experience at Langley, um, you can, some of the civil servants that I know are really hands-on, some are really hands-off. It, it just depends. But that if you are a civil servant, you have to be a little bit more conscious about making sure that you stay hands-on because it's very easy to get caught up in the politics and the day-to-day -day at NASA. So um, I don't disagree with that. I just recommend that you really, you have to make an effort to keep your hands dirty. Uh, okay, I don't know if you mentioned this earlier. Thank you for that response. I don't know if you mentioned this earlier, but which center are you currently working at? Um, did you work at? I, both times I worked at Langley. Um, I, I, um, I was considering working at Goddard. Um, we're still, I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do next, but both my experiences were at Langley. It's an awesome center. It's where Hidden Figures took place. Um, and also it's right next to the Air Force Base. So you see the F-22s take off, which is just so <laughs> cool at the Langley. <laughs> okay. And then we have one. Um, okay, so one from Justin. Uh, what should a freshman in college do now if they'd like to have a career in NASA? Okay, so a freshman in college should do a couple of things. One, don't suck at your classes. You don't have to be perfect, but don't suck. You got to, around that 3.0 mark is where you want to keep your grades. Two, I would encourage them to apply to their uh, state space grant. Um, that, again, the space grant is designed to get students who are interested at NASA to or interested in NASA on center as soon as they can. So a um, couple of things. One, don't suck at school. Two, apply to your state space grant. Three, find professors at your university who are doing space related research or the research that interests you and connect with them. Try to join their labs, I, even volunteer if you have to. Um, because again, getting those primary opportunities, are, it, that will really boost your application when you're trying to apply for a real internship or a pathways program. Nice. I didn't know that states have like a space, um, would you say a space like fellowship or a space? Space grant, yes. Space grant. I didn't know that's awesome. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, go ahead. I was going to say they fund undergraduates, graduates, um, they even fund STEM outreach initiatives. So okay. I've gotten they, they do different things too. They do minorities in STEM, women in STEM. Both my fellowships were minorities in STEM and it was six grand each year nice. for my research. So yeah, that's <laughs> pretty. That's awesome. Nice. That's good to know. Okay, one last fun question. Uh, what is your favorite memory working at NASA? Oh boy, okay. <laughs> uh, let's see, favorite memory. I, see what is it what is it what is it there's so many good ones um, <laughs> and i'm trying to think of one that's really cool so one when i was at nasa langley we did a tour of the virginia air and space museum which has a whole bunch of um which has a whole bunch of like spacecraft um and planes all that mm -hmm. and they said, hey, since you guys are NASA interns, you can spend a little bit more time, just really go through. They gave us a special tour. And while we were there, I actually got to see and touch the capsule for Apollo 12. So it's the capsule that actually flew around the moon 
and they just let you touch it? <laughs> he, I, I don't know if I was supposed to kind of let me. Yeah. But yeah, that's, that was a really cool experience. That's awesome. I was like, man, you would think that would be like, so like protective of everything they have in there just to like reserve or preserve the, their equipment. But that's awesome. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So definitely um, another really good memory is, uh, let's see, what's one really awesome tour? Oh, uh, they, during my first internship, we did a tour of the, of the antenna testing facility at Langley. And so there were two things. One, inside, they had a big anechoic chamber that was huge. And inside the chamber, there was a wooden crate. And the person who was giving us our tour said, oh yeah, inside that crate is the satellite dish for the Europa Clipper. So that's a dish that's gonna go to space in two years. Yeah. And seeing that is like, whoa. But the really cool part was outside of the lab, there was a chalkboard and the chalkboard had all of this math and this, these equations on it, it turns out that those equations were from the Apollo era that, that was written in the 60s and they just left it on the chalkboard. Wow. You would think that would get like, so, like they would just like accidentally just be like wiped off. Imagine that. That would that'd be crazy. Yeah. So to see that, for me, it's just crazy to see all those things be, be real. <laughs> it's like, yeah. whoa, that happened. That's awesome. That's so cool to witness that in like person too. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a question for you. Sure. What do you, so like, what's your next goal? Like, what do you try, like, what are you working on? <laughs> uh, I'm trying to graduate. <laughs> True. I, but what I'm really interested in at school is, and some of the research I did over this summer uh, correlates to it, but I'm working on developing a satellite capture robot that resembles an octopus or a squid. So it's got multiple tentacles and can just wrap around satellites in space. Hmm. Um, I really want to finish that and make that my master's thesis. So I, I'm just so excited to finish that. And then awesome. once I graduate, I want to try to land a civil service spot and just do space stuff. <laughs> yeah, keep at it. You're going to do so great. Um, should we do one more question? Okay, one last question. Sure. Um, wait, which one? Okay. What's the best internship opportunity that a student could pursue outside of NASA to prepare them for NASA? Um, outside of NASA to prepare them for NASA, I would recommend Boeing, Lockheed, especially their space divisions. Um, you can also work with a NASA contractor, a Jacobs, um, there, there are different, even within the private sector, the, the companies that service NASA are, they'll still give you great insight into the way that the agency works and the different technologies that are going on. Um, you can also consider if you're a US citizen doing the Department of Defense or any of the engineering corps, so the Air Force, the Army, Navy, because, or uh, Spayware, because they do aerospace things and a lot of that knowledge will transfer over into NASA. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much for dropping all of your wisdom and for sharing your STEM journey with us. And it's so good to see you kind of like in person after like following you for a bit now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's like my mind is, I'm, my mind is kind of in overload because I'm seeing all these people <laughs> in real life. And I'm like, whoa, you exist. <laughs> We're not just memes and icons. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, awesome. All right. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in to Aaron's talk. Um, if you want to stick around, Aaron, uh, join us on our Slack. Yes. Um, just to kind of engage with the rest of our attendees and um, hopefully prepare or get ready for um, our networking event. So as we take a little two hour break, just to kind of mingle around. Cool. Yeah, um, definitely. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time and we'll talk to you soon. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.